Yeah. Yep, do it. So that we can try and get through it all, hopefully. Yes, we got it. I just wanted to use the gap. Actually. I no, I just wanted to use that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> all right, so we are at Parks and Recreation. Mr. Hartman. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Parks and Recreation Core Services. Uh, departmental overview as of the end of uh, 2011, uh, we have 165 total staff. Our Parks Department has uh, 12 full-time employees. Our Recreation and Administration Department has 27 full-time employees. We have 11 um, part-time employees. They're called regular part-time or RPTs. And we have 115 auxiliaries. Uh, we operate 365 days a year with the Recreation Services. Uh, and parks are on response 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so most of our operations are, are around the um, uh, about 53 employees and 115 auxiliaries are the ones that deliver the actual courses. They're the uh, lifeguards, yoga instructors, those type of people. So our operational staff are part of the full-time and, and part-time uh, deployment and our programs are uh, primarily coordinated and run through auxiliary labor. Uh, in 2011, uh, and our core services reflect that, our parks uh, staff of 12 uh, service 41.2 hectares of parkland, which is about 101.8 acres. Uh, we have 1.6 kilometers of paved pathways and trails within our park inventory, and we have about 1.75 kilometers of gravel or chip pathways throughout our park systems. We have 46 landscape traffic islands, totaling just under 17,000 square feet. Uh, on average, we uh, process about 75 tree removal permits, and we plant upwards of 100 trees annually. Uh, in 2011, 86 of those went into boulevards, and 11 went into uh, Squamalk Gorge Park. In 2011, uh, we offered 345 different recreation programs, which accumulated uh, just under 11,000 participants over about 1,200 sessions run throughout the year. The Recreation Center uh, saw 99,000 uh, drop-in visits. We have 6,800 pass holders uh, within our uh, current inventory, and that resulted in 156,737 pass holder visits to the Recreation Center in 2011. Uh, Parks and Recreation or Recreation Services had 266,000 user visits. Uh, to the Recreation Center and Archie Browning. These are for drop-in programs, fitness, aquatics, those type of things. They do not include special event attendances, nor do they include repeat uh, people showing up for swimming lessons, as an example, that run over a period of 10 weeks. In the Sports Center for 2011, uh, we had 3,600 hours of arena ice rentals. We had 4,900 available, so 73% of that time was committed. On the curling side, we had 5,400 hours of curling ice rentals. We have just under uh, 14,600 hours available. What that is is divided over each of the six sheets of ice because at times we only rent three sheets of ice depending on how the uh, curling club or our users are doing that. So that's why the number looks a little skewed. Uh, however, only 37% of our curling ice is committed through contractual rentals. Last year, the Sports Center hosted eight large events and 26 medium events. In park bookings, we had 267 bookings at Bullen, uh, which resulted in just under 1,000 hours of use. Uh, we hosted eight large events on that field, and throughout our inventory, we had 275 events, which is everything from picnics, family and corporate, to weddings and other special events. Uh, the past year, we've been uh, quite heavily involved in social media, uh, involved with Facebook, Twitter, uh, Bitly, and QR codes. Uh, in Facebook, we have 396 fans, we have 719 check-ins. On Twitter, we have over 1,000 followers and we're uh, participating in over 56 lists. In additional platforms, we're involved with YouTube. We have three videos posted with approximately 200 views and we use Bitly uh, primarily for our activity guides to help share and shorten our links on our platforms. In a nutshell, the Recreation and Parks Departments have three primary revenue centers. Uh, program services being one, which are registered recreation special events. Uh, we have visitor services, which we uh, break into membership sales and drop-in admissions. And facility rentals are another large component of our business unit. 
and that is facility rental agreements and special event rentals. We have additional revenue streams as well, um, but these are the three primary focuses of our business. To give you an example, our program services in 2009, we had 338 programs offered. In 2010, through restructuring, we cut that down to 314,000, uh, or sorry, 314. And in 2011, we've uh, increased that number to 345. What you notice is the increase in registrant participants and the total program revenues. In 2010, we had a 1.1% increase over 2009, and that was to free up additional resources to restructure. And in 2011, we saw a 12.4% increase in revenues created from programs. The 2012 core budget, as it currently stands, is forecasting for a 25% increase in program revenues. That may sound aggressive, but in the fourth quarter of 2011, we were notified by Child and Family Services that we've secured additional out-of-school care positions, which is resulting in a net uh, revenue gain of about $90,000 by opening up 18 additional out-of-school care positions. Visitor services, as I said, is broken down into a number of membership passes and drop-in admissions. In uh, 2010, we saw a decrease of about 2.5%, and most of that was attributed to the opening of Panorama Swimming Pool. Uh, prior to that, they were under construction. We did have quite a few people coming from Sydney, uh, believe it or not, into Esquimalt. With that facility that opened in September of 2010, uh, we did see a decrease to our revenue streams. In 2011, we've been able to regain that, uh, that loss and add a bit, so we saw a 7.5% increase over the 2010 numbers. 2012 forecasts, uh, we're forecasting an additional 8%. Uh, for a drop in admissions, uh, we've seen that uh, slightly decrease, um, and uh, we're hoping to regain in 2012 back to the 2010 numbers. Facility rental services. Uh, one of the challenges with the program revenues is in order to run more programs, we've got to free up more space. So we have strategically chosen to rent out the facility less frequently for lower uh, profit and convert that available time into creating new programs and new opportunities. As a result of that, we've seen a decrease in our rental uh, fees, uh, rental revenues from uh, 44,000 in, in 2009 to 29,700 in 2011. Uh, we believe that with the uh, some uh, reorganization in the swimming pool and we're hoping for that government grant as well uh, to add the additional program space at the rec center, we should be able to generate about $34,000 and that primarily would come through birthday parties and a few other uh, smaller revenue streams. 14% sounds like a big number, but realistically it's about $4,500 worth of revenue. Uh, it's quite small. The sports center is heavily weighted in, in uh, contractual rentals. It always has been a readers traditionally do that. So we, in 2009, we're at 553,000 in rentals. Uh, in 2011, we're at 585,000, and we're forecasting in 2012 to be at 572,000. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, park rentals, uh, we've been pretty much flatlined all the way through. $4,000 um, is uh, small, but with the capital investiture uh, and the opportunity to expand into our parks areas, that's part of the reorganization we've been doing over the last year and a half with our parks department to find new sources of revenue in parks uh, to generate more revenues for the bottom line. 2012 challenges, we are uh, heavily uh, weighted in the economic climate of, uh, the, of the region. Uh, we have increased market competition for both the public and private sectors, which is why our, our uh, kind of investment in social media has allowed us to keep our advertising uh, expenditures under control by making sure we still have market penetration into areas outside of Esquimalt. If you think that we have 17,000, roughly 17,000 people that uh, call Esquimalt home and we generated 266,000 user visits last year, um, unfortunate to say they're not all Esquimalt residents. So we are drawing large numbers from other areas outside of Esquimalt, which is helping to balance the budget in some respects. Uh, the other challenge is we have continued reliance on sports center facility rental revenues and as you noticed, uh, we have no control over the number of people that uh, are joining the curling club. We have no control over um, the number of per uh, kids participating in minor hockey. All of those have impacts on our bottom line. The other thing we have seen since the new Langford facility is opened is it's becoming increasingly difficult to sell ice time past midnight, uh, which is a challenge because now you've got an additional ice uh, uh, surface available. Uh, we didn't lose any user groups, but what you saw across the region was rejuggling. 
And so that's why the forecast for facility rentals is down around is down around 572,000. Uh, is we're trying to recover and come up with some other strategies to generate not only rental revenue but increase program revenue at the sports center. And so we'll be bringing forward uh, early in 2012 a series of strategies to address that uh, concern and revitalize that area of our budget. Uh, the other issue we have or challenge is the need for strategic planning and park planning and open space infrastructure renewal. Uh, part of our parks uh, are aging and we need to make wise investments on how we um, revitalize those areas with the understanding and direction from council that there's an opportunity to invest in certain pieces of infrastructure, do things in certain ways or design our open spaces in certain ways that are going to allow us to generate more revenues if that is a desire of council. Uh, and the, finally, the other challenge we have is to develop our asset management processes to maximize our infrastructure longevity. We've just spent, um, from the taxpayer's perspective, 600000 on Archie Browning for a total of $2.1 million with the federal grants. We need to make sure that we're managing and maintaining those, that investment as best to our ability, and that is putting a call for increased asset management, and we're well underway with that, but it is a 2012 challenge for staff. Focus for 2012 is continue to develop our primary, primary revenue centers. It's further enhancement of our program services, visitor services, and facility rental services. The challenge for us and the focus is and will continue to be to diversify and enhance the revenue centers at the sports center to make sure that we're around a 60% recovery rate for that building uh, and to explore new revenue and cost recovery models for parks, play fields, and the sports center. In addition, uh, we're looking at further implementing energy saving and cost strategies to reduce our annual facility operating costs. We were able to successfully do this with the uh, upgrade starchy browning. In September, the new M compressor went in, which is allowing us to dramatically reduce um, our uh, utility budget. We will realize those savings this year uh, and we'll know the extent of what that is as of September of 2012, because we'll have one full operating cycle underneath us. Uh, we have plans and proposals to do the same thing for the rec center. Um, the other option is, or the other focus is on uh, capital resources and uh, revenue generating and expenditure reducing infrastructure. That is spending our capital dollars on areas that make money and areas that help reduce costs. Uh, again, we want to continue to revitalize and reposition our business units to ensure maximum and potential cost effectiveness. And again, we want to continue to aggressively position and promote parks and rec programs and services to maximize our sales processes. Uh, three of the recent campaigns we've undertaken since the summertime, uh, just three examples, you've probably seen them on transit shelters, in the rec center, on the back of BC Transit buses, on the websites, through our social media. Uh, right now we're focused on pools because that is a good source of revenue for us and the, and the final one is uh, program revenues at Archie Brown. So with that said, uh, any questions? Councilor Hodgins. Uh, Chief the Chair, Mr. Hartman, uh, just a question around, I noticed on Twitter that uh, you were advertising for uh, first aid services. And I'm wondering uh, about that, whether it's simply a service that you look to provide or if in fact it's uh, value added, it generates significant revenue. I'm not sure you might have those numbers with you this evening or maybe if you don't, we could look for something. Um, with respect to, to the service, it's a training service that we provide. Um, right now, it's an opportunity for us to break entry into a, a, a market that we're not currently exposed in. So through social media, we're able to minimize our advertising costs to test that area. The advantage for us is we have a, a, a lifeguard group. Uh, most of them are, are, well, they're all trained in first aid. Most of them are also trained as instructors. For us, it makes common sense to put more people at work uh, and generate additional program revenues by doing something we already do and expanding outside of just training lifeguards. Esquimalt trains a lot of lifeguards within the region. We do a lot of NLS training. We do a lot of Red Cross water and safety training. And these are for, these are pre-employment programs that are benefiting other municipal facilities outside of Esquimalt. What we've decided to do is to expand that and target businesses that are looking to have their staff trained in first aid because we're already doing that within aquatics, it's quite easy for us to do that and roll that out through other areas. So right now, it's, it's a brand new program or product line that we're looking at doing with, quite frankly, minimal costs. Thank you. Councilor Morrison. Um, 
I think a lot of people in this community and on this council as well are, are quite impressed with the um, how quickly and how successfully Parks and Recreation has embraced and implemented their social media strategies. Um, and you just mentioned in, in response to Councillor Hodgins that there is already some advertising uh, savings. Uh, I'm wondering if we're coming up to the next budget, have you been able to reduce your traditional advertising budget uh, because of the use of social media? Where are we at with that? Well, without uh, speaking directly to the, to the core budget, uh, we have seen savings. We've been able to do more advertising with less dollars. Uh, what we're proposing at this moment, until we know that we've got saturation in areas that we're comfortable with to hit the revenue targets, we spent $53,000 a year on advertising. Mm -hmm. I think last year we spent about 47000 of that. Some of that was investing in social media opportunities to get our systems up and running. Um, so what we have been able to do is to keep well of that, all of that under control. And by what you see by the revenue numbers being presented, um, we're not seeing that across the region. Uh, Squimalt seems to be an anomaly. Uh, the meetings I've been having with the other rec directors and my staff with the other recreation managers across the region, um, everyone seems to be down. Revenue numbers are down, the numbers are down. Um, we are, uh, quite frankly, blocking the trend. And I would attribute a lot of that to our, our aggressive and very niche campaigns around social media and product development. And well, so I'm very impressed with social, your social media campaign. The, the thing that I'm most impressed with, and I think may answer a bit of your, your, your suggestion as to why we're doing bucking the trend, is, that, is our hours of operation. We, uh, and I don't know all the hours across the region with other parks and recreation, but I know that there are other municipalities that aren't even open on staff days, for example. We're open every day of the year. In fact, I think we're even open on Christmas. I, I seem to remember seeing that advertised. So uh, looking ahead for, for the next year, is that um, protected? Or is there, do you expect any change or reduction to our hours of operation, including days of operation? Uh, you were through Council Morrison. That's in the hands of Council. Uh, it's been the direction of Council uh, since I've been here and uh, I arrived in the uh, late 2009 that uh, they wanted to be open on staff holidays. They wanted to be open at 5.30 and close at 10.30 or 11 o'clock. Uh, so what we've been able to do is to run business units and minimize the impact of staff on our operation and keep costs under control by being able to provide that. However, Council decides that there's other areas in the, in the organization that they feel need to have those resources uh, reallocated, then that's something that is up for you to discuss the policy. Okay, and, and I guess, sorry, one more through the chair. Uh, part of that discussion would be, and we don't know what it's going to look like exactly yet because we haven't had that discussion, but if, if we do want to maintain status quo on hours of operation, it may possibly um, require a discussion about the increase of of membership fees, uh, when I say membership fees, I mean the annual uh, fitness pass. Everything is, everything is open for discussion. Okay, thank you. All right, we have Councillor Handelby and then Mackay. Thank you, Chair. So you to Mr. Hartman. Um, I want to uh, tell you that I really appreciate the efficiencies that you have brought to the Sports Centre and look forward to the ones at the uh, Rec Centre. Um, I really appreciate the aggressive marketing and, and the energy of you and your staff. I wonder if you could um, remind us what events uh, we will see coming forward in the next year. I think there's at least one. Well, we have the Curling Classic coming up uh, in uh, the uh, end of March. Um, the, we're in the process right now of looking at television rights to that. Uh, we don't know if that will be secured this year, but uh, we definitely are, are pursuing that for 2013. Uh, so we've reinvigorated that contract. Uh, we're in negotiations right now with uh, some producers on some other opportunities. Uh, so without letting the cat out of the bag, these are the strategies that staff are working on. And really what we're trying to do is to take our reliance off of, um, you know, using the catcher's mitt philosophy of sitting back and waiting for user groups that we've traditionally relied upon, being primarily the Cougars, minor hockey, figure skating, and the curling club, to rent time from us, we're now aggressively either working with them or providing opportunity around the times that they traditionally require to offset some of those expenses and ensure that we've got more maximum capacity within that facility. And that's the strategies that we're starting to develop and have been developing. The challenge we had to do is get the building 
revitalized first. We put a brand new, for the most part, a brand new plant in the in the uh, sports center. It's got state of the art uh, mechanics uh, into an old uh, you know, cinder block structure. So what we're going to be able to see is we're reducing our energy efficiencies as we go. It's also allowing us to maintain and provide new opportunity and expanded programs. So what I'm suggesting is we need to start taking away some of the rental opportunities, our reliance on rental revenues, and put that back into revenue generating opportunities. And you're going to be seeing uh, some strategies coming forward, uh, hopefully early in 2012, uh, definitely by the summertime. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to comment on the fact that um, you have sort of focused on uh, recreation and events. And I want to tell you that parks are really important to the residents of this community. I have had all kinds of people tell me also how much they appreciate a pesticide-free uh, bull and park and for the kids to run around in the grass without worrying about um, what might be uh, the chemicals put on there. So I think that's really good. Uh, I'm very impressed with the fact that we're able to put in new parks. I also wanted to um, just touch on the fact that we've increased uh, in our um, uh, islands uh, on, on the roadways uh, all the extra plantings, and I know that's been a bit of a challenge. I actually haven't um, commented on it, and I was hoping that you would, because I think that it, it um, has been a challenge, I think, for residents who don't want to see all the planting things and to uh, are complaining about the heights, and also for those of us who really appreciate the beautification that it's brought. So I wonder if you could just make a few comments on that. Uh, well, of course, islands are a challenge, uh, and we made that uh, clear to council when they decided uh, with, to proceed with the Craig Flower expansion. The easiest thing to maintain, uh, Mr. Miller may disagree, uh, is asphalt and concrete. Um, however, there's a, there's a quality of life and a beautification aspect to that that does not exist with asphalt, or asphalt and concrete. Um, the challenge for us is uh, resources. We've been able to increase uh, the amount of uh, landscape boulevards uh, without having uh, substantial increases to staff. We've been able to do that through primarily the use of summer students during peak growing seasons. Uh, we haven't increased our staff base, uh, well, since I've been here. Um, so finding efficiencies within the operation, choosing our, our indigenous planting wisely, to ensure that we're not uh, putting in um, uh, high demand or high maintenance plantings, I think is, is key. And part of that comes down to that strategic planning for future expansion. Thank you, and the nursery will stay where it is? For the time being, yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mackay, and then Thank you, through the chair to Scott. Um, you mentioned on parks, uh, and I guess being lucky to work with you for three years uh, on Parks and Rec, you have not touched on D&D partnership, which I think is a big part to uh, the Parks and Rec because uh, we have some of their area that uh, they've given to us, if that's what you want to call it, but it's up to us to maintain. Uh, if you've got any more, you can enlighten us on it. Uh, Your Worship, through to Councillor Mackay, not at this time. Uh, we're still working with D&D on, and with reference, it's Macaulay Point Park. Um, we're working on our st uh, strategies, and part of that is strategic planning. And uh, we're getting all of our, uh, quite frankly, ducks in a row, and working with D&D to make a presentation back to Council and Esquimalt residents on what the opportunities exist between that. It's a contractual relationship. Uh, we own a section of the, uh, the park area. D&D owns... Uh, majority of the uh, the usable park area we own the parking lot uh, Anna and Buxton Green they own a majority of what residents have come to enjoy uh, for us it's park management strategies and those are the things and the focus for 2012 that uh, we'll be working on from an administrative uh, perspective and one more just uh, maybe kudos to your staff uh, the Japanese garden in Gorge Park looks fantastic uh, I think it's being revitalized in uh, top notch. And I think the people that go through it uh, are quite impressed with the job that the staff have done. So if you could pass that on uh, to me. Anyways, I really enjoyed seeing what's been done down there. Your Worship, through to Councillor McKay. We'll pass that along to our staff and our, our uh, artistic <coughs> contractor. Uh, we hope to have the Japanese garden finished uh, by the end of February. 
uh, with some type of a grand opening probably when the weather gets a little better in uh, late March and uh, we'll be sure to notify residents and council of that uh, opportunity. Thank you. Councillor Schindler. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, I think what I'm going to do is uh, uh, I'm going to hold my questions until we actually get down to the nitty gritty and talk about money as opposed to policy. Thank you. Um, I guess it's my turn. Um, looking back at um, when you talk about these, you know, 6,800 pass holders, memberships, and no charge, would the no charge be the life program? Um, for council that may not know, would you mind explaining the life program and who actually funds it? Uh, well, the life program is a uh, regional initiative uh, that Squamalt participates in that provides uh, families and individuals um, with low income uh, access to recreation facilities throughout the region. Uh, the funding for that program comes out of our operation. Um, and so it's one of those uh, opportunities where we're trying to uh, provide uh, quality of life for Squamalt residents as well as trying to weigh the pros and cons of revenue generation. Thank you. And uh, you touched on one other thing that uh, we get lots of outsiders, which I have no problem with people from other communities helping to pay for our recreational services. They can bring it on. Any other questions? All right, now we are on to fire rescue and emergency program. Chief Ward. Uh, Madam Chair, members of council, uh, prior to uh, making my presentation, I'd like to apologize for the size of my, size of my handouts. Um, my, uh, my assistant is very green, and she insisted that uh, we double-sided our uh, printouts. Um, I'm going to start. Uh, it's cost effective. It's okay. I'm going to start tonight's presentation uh, talking about the emergency program rather than the fire rescue. If I can get this. Uh, um, and I, I'd like to identify that um, rather than the deputy fire chief being responsible as the emergency coordinator, um, with the restructuring of the department, uh, I thought it prudent that the fire chief. Uh, move into that responsibility and so that consequently I'm responsible for the emergency program and the administration is handled by a, a, a point eight manager and so for 2011 um, that uh, emergency program manager has provided training courses and exercises for staff for the EOC and ICS which is emergency operations center and incident command systems um, established and maintained supplies for the EOC and the ESS teams um, and the communications group and NET program which is a neighborhood emergency preparedness program which I'll discuss later. Um, she also attended regional meetings and um, uh, emergency planning and management committee meetings and with the new newly um, structured uh, online communications committee she's part of that uh, that structure as well. Um, in 2011, the emergency program provided training for EOC, EOC personnel, and an excess of 70 courses were completed in 2011. And that's those are JI courses, and uh, they're for town, township staff and volunteers. So, and we've also had two simple EOC exercises in 2011, um, which in 2012 that'll be increased. Also, the uh, emergency uh, program manager is a member of the emergency um, planning committee, uh, which has represent representation from different departments within the municipality or the township. And then she represents a local government emergency program advisory commission. She sat on the great uh, BC shakeout organizing committee and sits on the regional transition to community recovery with the Red Cross. So very active in the, in the region. And uh, they learn to... Um, the Neighborhood Emergency Program consists on a, of a volunteer component and um, preparedness workshops for the public. Um, they provide individual and family preparedness and also they provide disaster first aid training to neighborhood residents. and. Um, 
They're the only net program in the region uh, that provides that disaster first aid training free of charge. And um, um, that is currently um, conducted, but it's a very small group and we only have three people involved, volunteers involved, but um, they're very active. They've made presentations to residents and various work groups and uh, over 240 individuals have attended workshops in 2011. The Emergency uh, Program Communications Group, that is also a, a small group of uh, six trained and certified amateur radio licensed volunteers. And um, they're a volunteer group. They provide er emergency operations center support and they support ESS, um, which is uh, emergency social services facilities and emergency communications equipment. And there's succession planning in the works in that area right now. We have a deputy uh, um, a volunteer right now because um, it's definitely important to uh, even in the in any volunteer organization to have succession planning because uh, although they're very keen they uh, as uh, um, obvious that uh, uh, volunteers also age so it's important to succession plan the ESS team this is uh, um, somewhat new. Uh, ESS used to be contracted out to the City of Victoria and um, uh, before I became your fire chief it was determined that uh, the township was not happy or satisfied with the service that was being provided so uh, they established their own ESS team and there are currently 22 people trained and they are uh, they provide evacuee assistance and uh, in a disaster or an emergency for an example in a large fire in an apartment they assist in um, providing short-term shelter for up to 72 hours, transportation and resource referrals for food, clothing and shelter. So they're a very, um, and they also run reception centers for evacuation situations and group lodging. So they're a very important uh, part of our emergency program. Coming in 2012, uh, there'll be continue, continued uh, um, expansion of our Squamal ESS team and ex they'll be exercising the contents of our emergency kiosks that um, there's uh, two kiosks right now located at the back of uh, Squamalt Arena complex and in those uh, containers are emergency supplies and um, last year we added also a, um, a kiosk at the uh, at the public safety building to maintain um, supplies for police fire in an emergency and um, we will be um, applying for JEP grants for our business continuity plan and that's one of our strategic uh, initiatives for the uh, council um, and also we'll increase regional participation of our volunteer components for the emergency program manager and also a continuation of our grade four program which has been very successful and that uh, that grade four program is uh, teaching the youngsters the importance of emergency uh, preparedness. Councilor Hodgins, do you have a question? Uh, more of a comment a question to the chair and the chief. Just that uh, we always get caught up in the acronyms. And, uh, JEP. The JEP is the Joint Emergency Preparedness Program. Is that still uh, money from the feds? Yes, and it's, uh, there's certainly not as much money available as there was. Uh, three or four years ago, so um, um, it's basically there's more money available for education and training, but not, nothing is uh, in regards to capital like a generator like there used to be available. Thank you. I'd like to now, if there's no further questions on the emergency program, if I could move on to give you an overview of the fire department. First, uh, the core service levels for the fire department, of course, fire suppression, and that's uh, fire suppression would be a minimum of one engine and an aerial and with a five person response. Um, and during a mutual aid, we'd uh, also um, be able to uh, have additional in engines and additional firefighters, so um, we can discuss that later. We're also responsible for um, first response medical aid in conjunction with BC Ambulance. Um, we support and rescue for motor vehicle accidents, confined space, fall restraint, 
tower crane rescue, low angle and shore, shoreline water rescue. We do not provide any water rescue because a number of years ago there was a financial contribution made to the Victoria Fire Department and they have a, that capability. So, um, hazardous materials response for confinement and cleanup of minor spills and assessment and a call out of specialized crews for major spills and we have uh, four members trained to the technician level and participate in the CRD hazmat response. Um, and also public service assisting residents with a variety of requests. Emergency uh, services response to NFPA um, for a career fire department which is a one minute for a turnaround time for a response, four minutes or less for arrival for a first arriving engine engine company at a fire incident and then a four minute or less arrival of a first arriving engine at a medical aid call not less than 90 percent of the time um, so for a full first first alarm uh, assignment within eight minutes response time 90 percent of the time that's where we would require 14 to 16 personnel and that has um, always been a challenge for Squamalt because uh, we we're limited to five staff on duty at one time so we rely for a, a large uh, full first alarm on um, mutual aid. So certainly um, our up and coming, if, if we're successful in approving um, our mutual aid with DND at the next council meeting, that's a huge benefit to, to the department. And in discussing mutual aid, we've always had it with San mutual aid with Saanich, Victoria, and an agreement with Oak Bay, not that uh, Oak Bay has ever responded into Esquimalt, but what, uh, with that mutual aid agreement, when Victoria or Saanich responds into Esquimalt, Oak Bay provides mutual aid as, uh, on standby to those municipalities. So it's a pretty good, when you, uh, we talk about regionalization and cooperation, I would say that that's in place now between the core municipalities. Um, I believe Councillor Hodgins. Well, yes, thank you. And through the chair to the chief, if you go back to your slide with respect to NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association. You may want to elaborate just a little bit on that because I think it's critically important that Council understand, you know, that that is an, an international organization that sets a standard around uh, emergency services and you may want to elaborate a Cal bit. Councillor, a bigger challenge to answering that question is maybe getting me to remove the, the slide well, backwards. Your response time may be more than four minutes. <laughs> yes. Yes, our response time uh, probably is more than four minutes, and, and certainly um, it's much easier track now with, um, with communications and uh, being dispatched from Saanich, the um, FDM is able to track all of that, and um, um, I think um, speaking in regards to national fire protection regulations, um, those are guidelines and, and we achieve to meet those uh, requirements, but it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough nut to crack. So, well, when you don't. talk about particular response times and you look at the, uh, the medical emergencies and through the chair, is that something that uh, is still up for consideration in terms of to what extent the Squimalt gets involved in paramedic services and support? Uh, has there been any ongoing dialogue around that, especially the opportunity to have the province maybe provide some fee for service? I, uh, our department has had no, no discussions on that topic. So. Thank you. So moving forward on to um, from mutual aid on to uh, the other core service levels for the fire prevention service. Um, that department um, is responsible for commercial and education and multi-unit inspections. In other words, um, we have uh, one of our assistant chiefs is responsible, he's a, our fire prevention officer and um, um, they're responsible for reading, um, for pre-planning, plan review. They work with, uh, in conjunction with the building department on in, any um, building application for permits. Um, we do uh, conduct fire investigations and conduct community education through the Learn Not to Burn program, commercial cooking, 
mechanic, CPR, fire extinguisher, and open house programs. And um, so, the, in regards to the fire investigations, all our fires are investigated by certified um, fire investigators. And there's uh, one firefighter on each battalion that's trained to investigate fires. <coughs> so, your staffing um, obviously, you have one fire chief. I have a part time or half time FTE fire secretary. That staff person supports our training officer and the fire prevention division and routine um, clerical duties. And then I also have a point eight FTE emergency program manager and she's uh, my executive assistant and a very small percentage of her job. We have four battalions each with six members and your department uh, restructure um, with the four retirements and three new hires. So um, with the restructuring, the deputy fire chief became operational. So that's, that's a reduction of one administrative person. And then um, maintain ongoing training issues. So um, we're staffed 24 seven and uh, with a total of 24 personnel and deliver protective service and acceptable standard in an economically efficient manner. Next slide uh, identifies some 2011 accomplishments and um, in, in lieu of our mobile data terminals we've moved away from that and um, into the iPad uh, installation of iPads which are far more efficient, quicker and um, an incident commander is able to take an iPad and actually walk around a structure when he's doing his assessing a, a structure fire doing a 360 he can take it with him. He can access uh, far more information on his, his iPad. And the best part of it is we're not having to pay uh, Sanitary Fire Department 5000 a year for support. So it's uh, far cheaper and uh, far more functional. Um, we completed the first phase of our seismic upgrade for the public safety building. That uh, was a large project and um, successfully completed. Um, all that pre-planning information uh, for inspections and commercial properties will now be accessible through our iPad so that uh, when staff are responding to a structure fire, they can go on the app to the certain address and they'll be able to bring up on their iPad the floor plans and, and the basic uh, um, any hazardous materials or whatever they're going to be faced with on, at that call. I know the flagpole and the fire pole installed at the fire hall doesn't sound like a big accomplishment, but it uh, certainly uh, speaks to uh, the morale of the department and the, and the culture of the fire service. Um, we replaced the command vehicle, which is still being uh, outfitted for radios and, and equipment, but um, that was process was completed after a, a green fleet review. We've developed specific specifications for engine 11, engine 11 or engine 2 and the plan replacement for 2013 and that may need to um, be moved into 2014 in, um, in order to support the purchase of a, a new generator for the public safety building. So um, obviously we... Thank you. Um, so I wanted to go back to the staffing, uh, if I could. You don't have to go back to the slide. But I just wondered if you would comment on the ongoing training requirements for each of your professional staff. Um, I recall that they're fairly um, uh, specific and that it takes away from the time. I mean, they have to be paid when they're doing this. It takes away from time that they would be sort of uh, sort of at the ready. So I wonder if you just might comment on that. There are, there are various aspects to the training counselor through the chair. Um, some of the training requirements are um, relate to promotions um, up through the officer ranks and then there's there's ongoing training on a daily basis that fire firefighters participate in in their different skill sets. Some of the firefighters uh, um, receive specialty training for um, hazmat, uh, technical rescue, rope rescue, um, and then there's your basic training every day on firefighting. And then, I um, hope that's a answered your question, but um, that's a big part of our budget and a, and a big part of our day is spent training. 
ongoing training. Thank you. And so, they have, is there specialized training then for tall buildings? Yes, that's. Um, there's uh, specialized training between the core fire departments because um, we obviously do not have enough firefighters to uh, um, adequately fight a fire in a high rise. So, and, and it's a specialty. Once you get up over six floors, it, it takes a lot of training to um, advance your lines, move your equipment up, up, the, uh, up the, the different levels of, of the building. So there is uh, specialized training for that. Could you just touch on then, uh, are, would all of our uh, firefighters then have that training? Yes, or they, 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 do, they do have that training. Thank you. Councillor Hodgins? Uh, through the Chair, Chief Ward, just to, going back to that, again, that slide on staffing, I'm just trying to add the numbers. So, the Chief, how many deputies? One deputy who is actually uh, operational, so he's, he's assigned to a, plat a platoon. Oh, okay. That, that, so there's 24 on the platoon, yourself? There's, six, there's myself as the chief, and then there's six staff on each platoon, and there's five that respond because one of them would be on holidays or training. Is there any, in fire prevention, any? That's a secondary duty of one of our assistant chiefs. And the training? Another assistant chief's secondary duty. And uh, just uh, one further question I heard from uh, Park and Rex, they're 24 7. Are you 24 7 as well with your services? Absolutely. Thank you. The last bullet there on 2011 accomplishments uh, speaks to our new, two new fire prevention bylaws um, and implemented and um, just for the record, uh, we've developed a brochure for that false alarm bylaw, which will, once uh, the graphics are completed, will be in your in baskets. Our 2012 objectives uh, will, the first one will be initi initiation of a three year program for a lock installation of the lock boxes in um, uh, condominiums and um, multi, uh, uh, any of the buildings that. Uh, are not single family dwellings, um, condominiums, and apartment blocks. And the reason for the three year initiation phase is because of the cost of installing, doing the coring. And, um, and then to be proactive, we need to work with the different, uh, different owners and, and rental agencies to give them time to develop a, a budget for their stratas to uh, pay the, the cost. Um, new emergency generator for the public safety building. The one that's there now is definitely on its last legs and uh, we will be um, fortunate if we can get through the budget process um, uh, on the one that we are using right now. And upgrade the fire hall uh, galley to support a post-disaster operation so that uh, um, members uh, for police and fire could uh, look after themselves in a disaster. Um, continue with collective agreement negotiations, succession planning for your fire chief and your deputy, that's ongoing. Um, over, overtime reduction or the, um, maintaining the current uh, overtime budget, uh, creation of a departmental, continuation of the creation of a department strategic plan, and then your 2012 objectives in front of you now are um, what uh, came from the um, council's strategic plan. So I know it appears to be a, an aggressive list of objectives, but um, I'm supposedly only here for another year and a half, so um, we need to uh, move forward quickly. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so um, in terms of your collective agreement negotiations, so when is the collective agreement expire? The current one? It's been expired for a year. Pardon me, two years now. Two years, two years. Two years yes. Right. So I guess it's time to be finished. Well, it's, uh, it is time, but uh, um, historically it's, uh, it seems like the departments wait for settlements on the mainland. I see. Thank you very much. Any other questions, Any other questions from council? Thank you.
to me. So we're, we're finished our, our general pre presentations for tonight, so I don't believe we're going to need to come back tomorrow, but there does need to be some discussion before we leave. Um, so I just want to take you through a couple more, a couple more slides. Here are what we call our budget challenges. When we sit down as staff and put together the budget and go review the budget, we pull out the items that we have no control over. We have wages and benefits, QP fire and exempt. That amounted to a 1.5% tax increase to fund those increases of $356,000. Centennial Celebrations was an early approval of $180,000 uh, expenditure, which uh, equates to a 0.79% tax increase. We have uh, two contracts that were approved um, in 2011 that affect our budget in 2012. And that is for recycling and compost and janitorial services, 0.18% uh, tax increase and 0 0.05. We have the victorious Guaymalt Police Services. Uh, the budget that we have received has a $389,000 increase in it, which equates to a 1.71% tax increase. That um, increase or that $389,000 has already been adjusted for the two officers, the, the two um, uh, community officers that we haven't paid for for the last two years. That was a, an increase in staffing two years ago um, that actually ended up um, in a dispute over not paying that that went to the Solicitor General's office and we were um, given permission not to pay for those because they didn't apply to policing in Squamal. Uh, so we don't include, include those in our budget. It's also been a $389,000 increase has also been adjusted for our dispute with uh, Victoria over uh, our cost sharing formula. Um, City of Victoria, our cost sharing formula is based on assessed values, assessment values, and um, City of Victoria is using the BC assessment assessed values, and we're disputing that because Public Works and Government Services Canada don't pay on those values. They only pay on the values that they think their property should be valued. So they take, they don't necessarily pay on BC. BC assessment, and normally um, if, they, if they disagree with the BC assessment values and pay on their own value, that value that they pay on is never higher than BC assessment, it's always lower. lower. Victoria is insisting that we pay based on money that we don't get, and we're refusing to do that. Um, that is still under dispute, but we're going to continue with our practice of how we do that. That's the direction we've gotten from Council. So both of those adjustments are built into the $389,000 increase. That increase reflects what we um, uh, are being requested to pay. Uh, and then the uh, relatively small increase from the library. But all of those increases together, staff hit the ground with a 4.43% tax increase right from the get-go. Um, so uh, you will see in section two of your binder, that the budget that has been put together, it has an overall budget increase of 4.83%, which means uh, outside of these 4.43%, the overall budget, including capital and supplemental, only increased by 0.4%. That doesn't make the overall number look any better, but it, it sort of gives you a history of where we started and, and where we're headed to. Um, the other item, I'll get to that later. So also included in that budget. So basically we started with a 4.43% increase. When we put all our supplemental and capital uh, requests in, it came up to 4.83. Um, like I said, those are the details that you have in your binders right now. Included in those, uh, in that 4.83% tax increase are, all, are these capital project contributions that didn't result in a tax increase. These are all the capital projects, $2.7 million, that are not being funded from tax revenue. They're being funded from grant revenue, they're being funded by capital projects reserve fund. These, the, these uh, don't uh, come into play with the 4.83%. So all these projects will be done with no impact on the tax rate, just from grant funding. And it's quite significant. We've had, um, we had one previous year, I think it was 2009, 
where we had, we were upwards of five or six million dollars, but that's when we had the Craig Flower Road project. Now we have a portion of that left, but it's still, I think, quite significant that we have 2.7 million dollars of capital infrastructure, uh, new infrastructure going in that is all from grant funding. So, um, so where that leads to is, here's where we're at right now. When we come back to council on March 6th and 7th, right now our budget has the 4.43% that we started with, 0.4% increase um, because staff, I think, did quite a diligent job of incorporating all of those budget challenges and managing to find some efficiencies to only come up with a 4.83% increase overall. There are some additional um, requests coming forward for personnel that amount to a 0.35% tax increase. So overall, where we're at right now is we have a budget that reflects a 5.8% tax increase. So what we're looking for from council tonight is further direction on what um, is, you know, we're gonna bring this forward on March 6th and 7th and we're gonna go through all the supplemental and all the capital requests one by one and we're gonna discuss them and we'll analyze them um, but we're starting with 5.18% increase. Okay, uh, first I have Councillor Hundleby and then Morrison. Uh, thank you. Um, through you, who was first? Um, this is staggering. I know it was going to be bad, and it was going to be this bad. Um, I know that, that previous councils have asked for uh, staff to look at efficiencies and seeing what else we could do. Uh, we heard tonight that the Sports Center it did some work with uh, Hydro and was able to change their lighting and so on. I'm just, I just wondered if you might, or with help of your staff, uh, sort of give us a little sketch about other efficiencies that have been done and if there's any possibility of other efficiencies without actually going to lay off staff or cut things that are really important. We have a lot of those in the those supplementary requests. We do have. Uh, it, 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 we're in the classic position of you have to spend some money to save some money. You, you, it takes, we have in those supplemental requests, you'll see retrofitting of some of the buildings, you'll see changing out of some of the lighting, or, you know, building efficiencies, and you'll see a lot of other efficiencies in there as well. Um, yeah. Are we able to use technology to be more efficient? Uh, granted, that will probably cost us money in the Technology covers a lot of departments in a lot of areas. I don't know that I can address that as, a, as an umbrella statement. Well, perhaps it will come out then over, over the course of our looking right. at the line by line. Right. So, so what I wanted to, to put to council too is that we have come forward, um, our council has given direction that we come forward with um, some alternative scenarios. Um, and if that is the case, I would w not want to wait till the 6th or 7th of March to get that direction. Because if council gives that direction tonight, we have three weeks to do a lot of work before we come back on the 6th and 7th. This is one of your scenarios. Like 5.18% is one of your scenarios. So council, what I, th I think I hear uh, Ms. Hurst asking for is maybe after our discussion we can kind of, much like we've done with the police board in the past, say give her three different benchmarks one of them being the 5.18% to come back with so that we can see what different tax increases would look like on that, on paper. But we'll have some discussion first and then we will come back with the percentage. So I have next uh, Councillor Morrison and then Councillor Hopkins. Um, yeah, and that touches on what I was gonna ask. So I know in past years you came up with, I think with three options. Um, and usually the low end option well, I guess the lack of a better term was sort of the bare bones budget, just things that we actually have to do and actually make sense to spend money on, otherwise it would cost us more money the following year or future years. So I, that's one of the options I would like to see is the, I think last year the, the, that most minimal tax increase option was around somewhere at 2%, I think, it may have been wrong, it was closer to 3%. I think it was, I think it might have been 2.5. 2 and a half, somewhere, I knew it was something like, yeah. <laughs> So I would like to see uh, definitely one of the options to be preferably no more than 2%. Um, the question I, I just want to be very clear on was with the, the capital, by including, that includes every capital request. 
And obviously some capital requests are, are much more urgent consideration. For example, just as recently as last week, we added one more capital right, request. $70, yeah, so that will be part, and, and so things as they've been coming in, both to staff and to council have been going on to that list. So, so 5.18 percent um, assumes that every capital pro request we receive will get approval. Is that correct? Right. Okay. And so, so while it does seem very high, that's 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 assuming that you were, right. we're not. It's very unusual for council to approve every every request. Um, not necessarily, and, okay. and here's why I say that because staff have spent. How many budget meetings, how many weeks have we been spending on the budget already? Three weeks? Yes. After, and that's after the departments put together their budgets. We sit in a room, um, in, in the Wordle room, and, and um, knock each other out fighting for what we think is important. Um, and we've gone through all of those capital requests. We've shifted some of them because we didn't start at 5.18. We started at over 8%. Okay. And so we went through all the capital. And so what we're putting forward is what we're recommending. And I have to say at this point in time, and Mary, correct me if I'm wrong, but out of all of the capital requests, the, the amount of money that we're asking for that translates into a tax increase is less than $100,000. The rest is coming from capital projects reserve fund, machinery and equipment depreciation. It, it's, it's not resulting in this tax increase. That capital is not, is, is not what's contributing to the 5.18%. And sort of just through the chair, and just one last question. And in, in that discussion that you talked about, and, and perhaps in, in presenting the low end, uh, lowest possible tax increase, as much as it pains me, is, I'm not recommending this, but I'm, re I'm just requesting that if this has been part of the discussion and will be part of one of, the, one of the options, is that if we look at our other revenue streams, such as fees, and I mentioned earlier that we have phenomenal recreation services, and I know that our director has been very, very, um, very careful not to have to increase any of those fees uh, when I talk about the membership fees. And well, I guess what I'm asking to make it very simple would be if we added a nickel or a dime or one or two percent on some of the things we charge for, for uh, bylaw infractions or for business license fees or dog license fees or for using our rec services, would that help us get that? that overall tax tax increase much lower. We will have those discussions at a staff level. Okay. Yeah. I, I can't answer that question off the top of my head. And um, I wouldn't be able to answer it at all without consulting with the person in, who's in charge of that department and having him look at that. But what we look for um, from council, obviously each each of the people sitting at this table is the expert in their area. I'm not an expert in each of their areas. I consider myself an expert in the finance area, but none of the other areas, which is why we sit as a group and develop the budget. Because what we, we get, what we get from you is, don't give us more than this percent tax increase, and then we get the experts to tell us how they can deliver a certain level of service for that tax increase. Nice. Yeah, okay. and that, and that's generally how how we operate. So, but the five point eight one eight percent that doesn't that assumes every other charge to be the, every other form of revenue that we get uh, pretty much stay status quo. Yeah, this, this is, uh, covers off all the core budget presentations that you saw today are reflected in this, to, to maintain those levels of service. And I can, I can say this with, um, um, with a lot of confidence, having been here for eight years, and out of six of those been in charge of the finance department, that when I got here eight years ago, our annual budget um, and our, our, our year end would end up with a, a surplus in the neighborhood of $750,000, which is a huge indication that your, your budget has a lot of fluff in it. Now we have a surplus at the end of the year in the neighborhood of $100,000, which means we've tightened those budgets up, especially over, I would say, the last three years. We've really tightened up those budgets. Um, this 5.18% keeps us at status quo and maybe improves our service level slightly. Um, but I don't even know if it improves our service level. This 5.81% allows us to maintain status quo on our service levels and try and accomplish the new strategic uh, objectives that Council has set. 
we're, um, it, it is, I just so that we're not pulling any punches here, it's going to be very difficult to get down from that 5.18% without some service level impact. Thank you. Okay, we have Councillor Hodgins and then Shane. Through the chair, uh, uh, Ms. Hurst, mm -hmm. uh, appreciate the hard work that's been done to come in at the 5.18. I think we still need to seriously consider reducing that. And I would like to see it tied to a financial indicator that the public would maybe uh, have more acceptance around. So when you look at, and I'll ask for advice in terms of what that indicator could be, and would it be the rate of inflation? Would it be the cost of living? Seems to me the cost of living indicator is something that the public tend to understand and maybe accept. So. Uh, I don't know what that is currently. I believe it's around three or less. Yeah. So it's, if you're talking CPI, I guess, um, and um, and this is just my own personal finance position, but the CPI is not actually reflective of the inflationary costs. Yeah. CPI, you're right, it's around three percent right now. Yeah. But if you look at, if you go, if you dig further than that, and you look at the economic indicators, which is the increases in utilities and hydro, they're more up around the 12% mark. So it has to be, you have to look at all of, all of those things, I think. I mean, I, I totally understand what you're saying, that you, you want to use an indicator that people are more familiar with and yeah. that they can tie it to. So um, we can have that discussion and, and certainly look at that. that. That would be great if you could yeah. do that. And I think, you know, in terms of <coughs> us all collectively, you know, trying to meet the challenge of protecting the service levels and at the same time uh, we don't want to revolt. So, <laughs> yeah, if we could look at a number that uh, people generally accept. And, okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Shinbine, then. Uh, thank you. To the Chair, staff, uh, my question is, in your deliberations, at any point, have you discussed staff reduction? Or has everything been maintained at the status quo? My, um, my, my uh, terminology uh, for staff reduction or is service levels. Service levels for us result in staff levels. So uh, what I'm asking is, yeah. was that even discussed? We've had some preliminary discussions. We didn't sit in a room and say, oh, council's going to be fine with 5.18%. We sat in a room and said, we're comfortable going forward and saying, here's what we're faced with. We, we started at, at, at 8% and we brought forward as our first presentation 5.18%. But we've also had more discussions about, okay, everybody, we need to think about what we're going to do and what impact it has on service levels and where we might uh, find efficiencies or make cuts in order to get to a different level. So, in essence, you're saying, Yes. That you actually talked about staff reductions. We we talked about service level reductions. <coughs> and for us, I would say uh, as Scott, especially uh, Director Hartman, in his his, his department, what ninety percent of your budget is is wages. It's between wages and utilities. Yeah. So for a service level reduction in his department, automatically translates to people. I would keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Hanley. Thank you. Through the chair to Ms. Hurst um, and perhaps uh, to others. I'm really interested in the idea of increasing revenue and I know that some of the fees and charges have been done in consultation with other areas so that we don't price ourselves out of the market. So I'm wondering whether there's been any discussion then with any of the other um, municipalities who also provide these same or charge these same uh, for these same uh, services and in particular the business license um, I know that sometimes there is a there is a so not sometimes uh, that there is a multiple municipality business license and so I'm wondering if you might comment on the um, logistics of working from that point of view of 
on increasing fees and charges in concert with with uh, other areas? Um, we can always do a, um, a review of our fees and charges, and I think, um, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but you do that more frequently than the rest of the organization does. I think I don't know how often you do. Do you do that on Certainly an annual, annually. annual annual basis for parks and recreation? Um, uh, organizationally, for our fees and charges bylaw in general, we do it a lot less frequently, and I don't can't remember when the last time was that we did it. But it, but we're due to do one. Yeah, I can say development services yeah. is due to redo their fees. Yeah. yeah, so we are due to have that review, so that wouldn't be out of line. But then I, I need to say, you know, by the time you do all the comparisons, get all the information done, and change the fees, and do your public consultation, or it's going to be 2013 before you see the results of that. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be done, and that we can't do it. We can do it. But Parks and Rec does it on an annual basis already. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it's a hard question. <laughs> and uh, as a taxpayer and sitting on this side of the bench, it's even a harder question. But um, 5.18, um, to me, I'm still thinking that's still high. And I don't know whether it's staffing that needs to be uh, brought into line more or whether increases in our, uh, what we charge for our services. Uh, you know, uh, I'm looking for more information, I guess, from you to say, you know, how did you come up with the 5.18 uh, to convince me that that is your bottom line or whether we can go lower? Yeah, I, I just, I need to make a clarification here. We didn't, I, I was not saying that we are coming forward with 5.18 and that's our bottom line. I'm advising you tonight that that's where we're starting. We're starting at 5.18. Okay. You need to know that before you see all the details that make up that 5.18. Because when we come back on the 6th and 7th, you will get those details of what everything that makes that up is. Okay. We certainly didn't put this in front of you and say, this is 5.18 and you need to approve it tonight. Absolutely not. This is 5.18 and this is where we're starting. Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah. I, I, didn't yeah. So I understand where you're coming yeah. from. Yeah. yeah. That uh, 5.18 is our starting yeah. gig. And we have for the 6th and 7th, just so that, you know, for those of you who haven't done the budget process before, we have 8.5 by 11 worksheets with every item listed on them and room for you to make comments. And we'll, we will go through that on a departmental basis and each of the department heads will go through each of those items, describe what they are, describe what the impact would be if you didn't approve it or if it got cut. And we will do that on the 6th and 7th. So, and just so that you know, there is absolutely no possibility that we will have a free night on the 6th and 7th. We will be here both nights. <laughs> um, Councilor Hunt. Thank you. Is it too soon for me to make a motion? I want to have a comment first, if I may. Um, I was reading the Municipal World a few months ago, and they had some great comments on municipal budgets that I kept thinking, you know, we're going to need to hear them at this point. It's not just us who needs to hear them. It is the residents, so I thank the four that are in the audience right now. Um, municipalities are mandated to deliver a wide range of services. And over the years, residents have come to expect a high level of service. Um, but unfortunately, the gap between demands and costs have widened due to downloading from various levels of government. Um, municipalities cannot keep doing more with less. So when budgets are cut, expectations must also be reduced. Um, so I'm saying this for, for everybody. We can't have our cake and eat it too. So um, there will be some tough decisions to look forward to. Um, I did have one question for staff on, on procedure. Before we make a motion for something to go forward to next, to the March 6th and 7th, should we pass all of the information that we've received tonight as, as received for information? Um, Received. But you, you can move it as received, and I would also suggest that we do the public input portion before council does a resolution as well. Okay. Um, so do I have a motion for receipt? So moved. Second. Sir? I'll second. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion carried. Um, no, I'm okay. I, I, yeah, I just missed procedure questions. Um, so um, staff. We should do public input, and then we'll do where we want to take the 6th and 7th. Uh, I'm 
I'm just suggesting it's, it's totally up to council. I suggest it might be a good process. Yep. Sure. So at this point, I will call for public input. Is there any member of the public that would like to speak? Please state your name and address for the record. Thank you. <coughs> Linda Shumlefel, 999 Worthing Street. Thank you, Madam Chair, Council, and Municipal staff. First of all, I have to say this has been really an educational evening, and it reminds me of a far side cartoon where there's this classroom and the teacher and the students, and the student puts up his hand and says, my brain is full, can I go now? But I really want to commend, <laughs> I really want to commend the municipal staff from my point of view it seems like you run a really tight ship, you know, really responsible and so detailed, it's amazing to me. And I get it now how this all works. Uh, like you run the business from the elected voice of the people. And that's pretty cool. I, I'm really glad I came tonight. Um, <clears throat> I never know when is the appropriate time to speak, but I think it's tonight because I'm not coming back on to the next time. <laughs>
Laurence Patrice. Um, the same, I'm asking for a sidewalk on the street. Uh, there's lots of traffic and uh, it's not very safe to go there on the street with all this car. So that is my request as well. Mr. Noyes, really? Would you like to speak? <laughs> uh, John Noyes, uh, 928 Garthland. Um, I, it's been very interesting. I'm sorry I wasn't here for the whole uh, thing. Um, the residents in our area, I think I can safely say, are really looking forward to the phase three of the phase one of Craig Park, where we will get back uh, completing the sidewalk as these ladies say, sidewalks are so important. And uh, uh, my understanding is that we're going to have a continuous sidewalk on both sides of the street. And uh, we're really appreciative of that. I guess the only question I have, and this may not be the place to raise it, but I'm going to, is the Craigflower Bridge. And you read in the paper, it's Saanich and it's View Royal. But there's no mention of the Squimo, but the Squimo, presumably, the Comfort Inn is not in the Squimo? It, I'll, I know just let staff get the answer to that. I'll, I'll defer to Anna because we have answered this question. It did come up, uh, and Jeff can also yes. answer it. But our property ends um, and doesn't encroach on the street, therefore, um, it's not, we're not a part of the roadway that leads to the bridge, therefore, we're not a voting member of, uh, or a paying member for that bridge. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to assume that's all the speakers, um, just because I can do the math. Um, so, at the <laughs> so at this point, um, Council, I think we need to give staff some direction for the March 6th and 7th meeting as to three options. We already have one, which is the 5.18%. Um, so I'm looking for two other numbers to have staff come back with Councillor Hundle, Hundleby. Thank you. I move that uh, Council recommend to staff to bring forward a report that would include a 2.5%, a 4%, in addition to the 5.18%. Do I have a seconder? I'll second, and I, I have also maybe a friendly amendment. Go ahead. I, I really think it's important if we could tie a number to the cost of living. Just so that we do that research. I don't know how difficult that might be, but I think it's important so that uh, the public generally understand that it's not just grasping it or a number, but rather we're looking at a number that uh, we can apply. If you, if I'm making myself clear. I believe so. Um, Councillor Hunnaby? <coughs> Thank you. I'd like to speak to my motion. Um, I put the, these forward, these numbers, because I felt that 2% was still below the cost of living. And so I put it at 2.5 and then I picked 4% because it was kind of in the middle. I certainly support <coughs> Councillor Hodgins' ideas of having some sort of financial um, indicators that would assist residents to do that. And I, in my uh, deliberations uh, earlier, I had looked at uh, 3.89 that came from the federal government. Um, I also understand that the CPI as we see it doesn't include some things that we would normally consider, like utilities, um, including hydro water and uh, fuel. And I think it would be important, although we might not get an indicator that puts the whole package together, I wondered whether even we picked them out individually what we could do, because it comes from a, an organization that's acknowledged and it's considered a standard or whatever, but it would help us then sort of see, and I, I know that the residents all know when they go to the fuel pump, they know that it's a lot more, they know that it's more for groceries for what they've always bought, those kinds of things, but having a number that explicitly specifies that I think would be useful. So in addition then to those, but I sort of, made an assumption here, correct me if I'm wrong, that staff would come back with those indicators to help us um, in our deliberations as we go forward. Having a report that says two and a half and four is just really another beginning 
uh, it's not really, but we could do something in between, and it, it may come out that it be, may come out in between there, just in terms of how we say yes, no, yes, no on our line by line. Thank you. Councillor Shinvine and then Morrison. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to uh, get a friendly uh, amendment on the motion. I would also like to see a 0% budget. And if you want to call that your slash and burn budget, that's fine. But I would like to see that as a starting point. What would our budget look like if we had no increases? Thank you. Councilor Morrison. I was also going to suggest a, a friendly amendment. Mine was just simple adding a word approximately in front of each of the percentages because I did I wouldn't want to have staff be so close and then you know they're at 3.99 and for the four percent option and then have to go through another five hours of discussion just to find that so I wonder if approximately in front of each of those percentages would be okay uh, I'm certainly fine with putting the word approximate that would make some sense to me um, um, I the zero percent is to me not a friendly amendment um, because we know for the most part that uh, the cost of living is much higher than 0% and we all know that most of what we do here is based on staffing and the collective agreements probably all across the board with a few exceptions uh, and they are higher than the, the 2% that, that others have gotten. It's realistic for me to come forward with 2% from that point of view but you know, given what we've started at 5.18 I felt that Two and a half is a better number, but I you know I would consider two percent as a friendlier amendment uh, that I that I could probably live with. But I, I don't think I can live with even considering a zero percent, uh, given that it would mean a lot of cuts that would be um, really hard on. Um, thank you. I'm hoping at this point, Council, that instead of keep changing amendments, like we're just going to have the discussion and then we narrow it down, then we can put pick one friendly amendment. I hope that's okay. Um, I'd just like to chime in a little bit here. Um, along with the 0%, my concern is we already have a 4.43% that we have no control over increase. So dropping it down to zero might be more than slash and burn. It might be lighting a match with kerosene. Like, it's, it's going to be really bad. So um, I would agree more with a, I was thinking a 3%, but um, I will, I will so I'm happier with the two and a half myself. I really think, considering we are starting with something that we have no choice, and it's a 4.43%, you know, it's going to be some cutting, even getting back to a two and a half percent. So um, we need to make a final decision. I've heard um, two, I'm not hearing a lot of warm and fuzzies for for zero percent, so I'm, I can see we're starting at two um, to a, for the other two, so can we start narrowing it? Motions two and a half, motions two and, and two and a half, and four. Approximately oh, two and a half. And approximately, so. Approximately two and a half percent. So three percent. times saying approximately. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, we haven't actually, it, the friendly amendment we don't need to vote on, so right now we're at approximately two and a half and four, and Councillor Hodgins, you had a comment. Oh, just to pick up on Councillor Shinbein's uh, suggestion, uh, I think I understand where he's coming from when he says zero. It, it, you know, it just takes you to a place where you really have to be serious about looking at you know, what might be or could be. And, and possibly we should consider that maybe over the longer term. Uh, this is, you know, for me, it's my first year of budget at this side of the table. And uh, you know, if we can work our way through some of the numbers being suggested in the motion, but not, let, not forgetting that perhaps a zero is something for next year or the following year, but making sure that staff have appropriate time to, to, it's a lot of work to put a zero budget together, and I don't know that we could do it in the time, in the right way, we could, we could probably do it, but maybe it wouldn't be, you know, uh, the right way to do it. So, over the longer term, I understand what you're saying. Councillor Morrison. Without being exact or having to be precise in any way, shape, or form, I wonder if, if there could be in the cover sheet or the report that we get back with these options, just something very high level that says, um, for the information of public and for council, that 
if you were to, if you were to even consider a zero percent increase, it would mean, or the, the directors have, have have established that in their estimate, it would mean they can take such drastic measures as uh, drastically reducing the hours of operation of our parks and rec services, or closing one day of the week, or or even having the uh, hours of operation municipal hall closed down at three o'clock as opposed to. 30 or something, it's just something like that, just, just so that the high level kind of, if we went there without having to spend the hours and uh, determining precisely, but just people need, because we hear it all the time, I used to advocate myself what a zero percent look like, and we never knew precisely, like, black and white as to um, what this would mean for our lives as this final residence uh, in terms of services and service levels. Um. I would agree that it would be nice to know what a zero percent. I think um, Councillor Hodgins hit it on the head. This year, I think that's a lot of staff time when we, we we're, we're not sure we're going to get there. So at a higher level, you know, I understand I, that that wouldn't be so bad. But I don't want us to waste a lot of staff time when we only have three weeks on something that I'm pretty sure we're not going to bite on anyways. But for next year, as they're going through the budget process from the very beginning, it could be definitely an option and maybe direction we can give um, at the end of our budget process as they go into the next budget process. But that's just my opinion. Councillor Hunnaby? As attractive as 0% sounds, I'm not sure how realistic it is. I'm very concerned that we also have collective agreements that go on. They're usually three years, and I would think that if next year is a, not a non-negotiating year, um, but it's still, a, it's last I heard it was two, two, and two. Yes. Um, I'm really concerned about what that would mean to our service levels. Um, I think that we already have been hearing complaints about service levels that we have. I, I don't think I'm willing to look at a garbage collection once a month or once every two months. Uh, things like that. I'm just really concerned about what that would look like, and we could cut all kinds of things that make it look really silly. But I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure that how much value there really is to just say that well, it was an exercise that you know we really don't want to see. Um, I'm really quite shocked that 4.43 is the, the is the first number, and I'm quite upset by it. So I'm sorry, I can't even think about zero percent. Um, Council, I think we've, we've had some good discussion. Is there a chance that we can vote on the motion? Which, would staff mind reading that motion back, please? Okay, uh, there was a motion that uh, Council requests staff to bring forward a report uh, with budget increase options of approximately 2.5%, approximately 4%, um, in addition to the 5.18%. Do I have a, we have a mover, a seconder, are we ready? Did I get the seconder? I didn't know this was the I did. Okay. Oh, I, I had you with bringing the motion. No, that's what it was. Sorry. Linda. So I will call the question. Okay. Shorthand. Does All part those of in favor? Those opposed? Councilor Schindbein, opposed? Motion carried. Now, may, can I have somebody make a motion for a German? So move. I'll do that. <laughs> we have a first and seconder. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion carried. We are not here tomorrow. Right? Oh, nice. Not tomorrow night. That's what I meant.